Right, so I'd like to thank um, Ms. Valerie Jenkinson of the Operators Without Borders. She's a chair. And for finding us at very short notice, short, short notice, Mr. Ian McIlwam is who is the current chair for the Canada's National Critical Infrastructure Working Group and the Canadian Mirror Committee chair for ISO TC224, which developed the International Standard on Crisis Management of Water Utilities, that is ISO 24518. Ian has been instrumental in developing public works emergency and continuity programs in his position as manager, compliance, and regional municipality of Durham. He is currently leading the response to the COVID-19 for Durham region, water and wastewater since emergency declaration on March 17, 2020. He is the current chair of the Security and Emergency Management Committee for the Carib Caribbean Water and Wastewater Association. Uh, Canadian, that but should be yeah. Canadian Water and Wastewater yeah. Association. <laughs> I think that's an error by, by Valerie, perhaps, or, or one of us in writing your bio, which cooperates with Public Safety Canada and the other federal departments concerned with the emergency preparedness and national security to actively contribute to the knowledge base and federal programs related to critical infrastructure. So it gives me much pleasure to welcome Mr. Ian McIlwan um, to be our presenter today. Over to you, Ian. Thanks, Ignatius. And uh, yeah, that, uh, that intro was probably the most formal part of my presentation. Um, Valerie asked me a little late yesterday, well, maybe midday, uh, to see if I could present. And I do have a topic I'm quite interested in, so I thought you might be interested in as well. Um, it takes place in Durham region and across Canada and the States as well. Uh, I'm not the lead for this project, but I, I'm quite familiar with it. So I'm going to give you the basics today. And uh, obviously, if you want to reach out to me afterwards, I can give you a bit more polished answers and uh, a little more in-depth. Uh, but what I want to talk about today is, uh, and I'll just share my screen if I can, yeah. see how this goes right there. Okay. And just uh, if we can just get this. There we go. Can uh, everyone see that now? Yeah, all good. Yeah. Okay, so basically what I'm going to talk about today is I'm just going to shrink this away too. I kind of had to move upstairs today out of the basement. I'm normally working down there lately. Uh, it, presentation today is going to be on wastewater surveillance uh, and how it's used for modeling COVID-19. Um, and what wastewater surveillance basically is, it's uh, sampling wastewater or using online instruments to monitor for certain parameters in your wastewater, either your raw or your treated effluent. Um, it's not new by any means, uh, you know, what the thought process is behind it is that early indications, particularly for infectious diseases, may show up in wastewater sooner than the other indicators, the traditional indicators like people going to the hospital, people off sick from work, um, uh, pharmacy visits, things like that, that or testing, such as a PCR test, uh, particularly in Canada right now, it, it takes days and days if you can even get one, and then another four days to get your results. So everything's delayed quite a bit. Th those are your main modeling things, your hospital numbers, your case counts. But with wastewater, you, you get an early snapshot of that. So, so what you get is basically if an individual has been infected by COVID, uh, that person through using the toilet, will give off certain RNA pieces of the SARS CoV virus. So those indicators can be, uh, I'm just gonna toss that phone somewhere, but not near me. Uh, those indicators can be sampled and then monitored and then tracked and plotted. So 
what you generally do is you look at an area, a known catchment area, say you have a, a lift station or a sewage pump station that services 2,000 people. Then you sample, you send to a lab, and you get what's called a COVID signal. And that just measures the number of those RNA chains that are in that sample. And then because you know it's from 1,000 people, it gives you a rough estimate of, you know, roughly how many people could be contributing to have COVID. So it's not a precise science, but it is an early warning system. Um, so originally in Ontario and in Canada, uh, we started doing this quite a ways back, like a year and a half ago. And it was mainly for background information. But then when Omicron hit, Omicron took out our ability to test in Canada. None of our, particular in the province I live in Ontario, um, we are so overwhelmed by Omicron in cases that we simply cannot test all the people. And now you basically self-declare if you have COVID. So in order for our modelers and our politicians and our decision makers, they can no longer rely on the traditional hospitals, case counts, test results. They've actually turned to our wastewater surveillance program and they've used it for the next set of regulations and forecasting in Canada. So it really is uh, nice to see it being used and it, it really is shining a good spotlight on the wastewater industry. Okay, so what we have here is we are part of, Durham is part of the Canadian uh, coalition, wastewater coalition. And these dots here are all across Canada. Those are water pollution control plants or lift stations from which um, municipalities, utilities are taking samples and that data is collected. And right now we're mainly using universities as our partners. Uh, our wastewater operators and folks, they get the samples, they get it over to the university labs those folks analyze it and then it goes to a website. So there's a broad representation. And I know we have some folks from the States on WEF today. Uh, they have this similar thing in the US, the CDC has one and I believe WEF does too with exactly the same uh, participating uh, operations. Okay, so in Durham region, uh, Durham region, some of you have heard me spoke and some of you have met me in person in the Caribbean, which is always nice. Uh, Durham region is made up of about 750,000 people. Uh, we have eight municipalities. We're about 100 kilometers wide by 100 kilometers north to south. Uh, we have 13 major water systems and 12 wastewater systems. So what we did is we set up sampling at these are our plants. So at five plants and two pump stations. And what that did is that captured geographically our area. So that is the kind of municipality of Pickering, Ajax, Whitby, Oshawa, Curtis, Newcastle, sorry, Bowmanville, Newcastle. And then way out here is a little hamlet that I live in. So, but we don't have any wastewater services. We're, there's about 300 of us live in the hamlet. So it's quite nice. Okay, so what were the opportunities we initially looked at? Uh, it uh, can be used for monitoring small communities to determine uh, absence or presence. Uh, you know, north our northern communities that might not have available testing might not have hospitals right handy to get that extra data from. Um, they can test their wastewater. Uh, it's also very useful for variants of concern. Uh, once we take the sample to the university labs, they not only look at it for the traces of COVID, the RNA tracers. Um, but they also do it uh, genetic sequencing for um, the variants of concern. So it, it's also very valuable for that as well. And uh, COVID does go through the wastewater system, and, uh, but by no means can it infect the operators. There's, there's no uh, data suggesting that wastewater is a transmission for uh, COVID um, to the general public or to staff in there. Uh, the precautions we take in working on an industry are the same precautions you would take for handling uh, COVID samples, just your basic raw waste or raw sewage. Um, uh, it's a bit of a source of pride uh, too for your, those involved, you're helping out your community. So this was the early days. So we started in Durham back in November, 2020. And as you'll see at the start, these are cases. So that was our first wave, second wave, third wave, fourth wave, and unfortunately we're in a fifth wave now if the data would continue. 
So at the start, that is the COVID signal. So it was kind of mirroring the cases. That's not really what you want. You want it to be like this, where it's the leading edge. So before we had to fine tune our algorithms, things like that, our sampling locations. Once we got that in place, we, we did achieve the desired results we wanted to. So for example, here, we knew it was gonna to continue to rise, yet our hospitals and our cases weren't for another week or so. It's usually about a week delay, you'll see, between the signal of COVID and wastewater and your rise and falls. Um, this is what, this is a little complicated slide, but uh, like I was saying before, is this is what you actually monitor. It's N1 copies, N2 copies, and those are just, copies of RNA. So that long, huge chain, that uh, DNA in that, um, within that's the RNA, and you can monitor that for COVID. So that is exactly what, when we take those labs to sam or samples to the lab, what they're monitoring for. So you see those little dots and, and together it gives you a very complicated chart. Variants of concern I mentioned. So these are the variants of concerns throughout the pandemic in Durham region, they're not Canada wide. So you'll see that, you know, the gamma, the delta, the beta, the alpha, and you'll see as we transition through waves, obviously the alpha, the first wave died through. The second one was the gamma, and then we had beta, and now you would have Omicron off to the right here at an extremely steep rate. Okay, so what kind of were the next steps? And this was early on before we were approached by a, uh, the science, kind of the health science table for Ontario and Canada. So we thought it was kind of an emergency science. Uh, it, the, the data needs to be interpreted with caution um, and the degree of accuracy is lower as the overall COVID signal. And that's what we call those, those markers. As if they're a strong marker, it's a strong presence of COVID in your community. So as they get lower, it's difficult to detect. So last summer, um, Ontario went through a nice recovery and we got to open our restaurants and our bars and our athletic stadiums and family events. So our signal went very low. So it wasn't very useful then, but as soon as it crops up again, you, you know something's coming. So it was great for that. Uh, that's just decreasing 10. So the next step at the time, uh, we thought we would continue to participate with our regulatory body, which is the Ministry of Environment, Climate Change, or sorry, Conservation of Parks. Uh, collaborated with Public Health Agency of Canada. Uh, they were trying to sequence all the variants and they still use it for that. So that was kind of where we were at. Initially, it was a great project and we thought we'd keep going in the background. Then Omicron hit. So what happened with Omicron? Uh, in Omicron in Ontario, I'm not sure how much you're aware of our situation in Canada. It's uh, similar to the states. It's quite horrific. Uh, we have thousands and thousands of cases, and that's per day. Uh, we have lost all ability to test, to test in an accurate fashion. Um, previously in Canada and Ontario, the only acceptable test to say you had COVID-19 was a PCR test, which you had to go get from a health professional, a pharmacy, a doctor, and then it would take you about two to three days to get the results. What happened was Ontario could process around 70 to 80,000 of those tests a day, and that was fine. Omicron hit, and we were seeing 10,000 people or more, up to 100,000 in a day get sick. We had no way to test that. So what they did was they had to say, okay, we've got to reserve these PCR tests, not for the general public, only for health professionals, uh, those in places like long-term care homes, and for people that need it for part of their job, like paramedics. So the general public was told to take a rapid test, which we can buy or get free, or if you had a certain number of symptoms, you just declared COVID. So in order for the modeling table, which every month or so they'll, Ontario and Canada will put out their modeling, and that allows the politicians, the health professionals to, to look at the data and make decisions about lockdowns, uh, vaccine mandates, things like that. So they'd lost that control because of a lack of data. So they turned to the wastewater industry, to 
our sector. We had data, we had a year and a half of data going. So now it's nice to see that their latest round of projections, and this is taken right from their presentation. This was, uh, sorry, I'm way down the screen here. Uh, that was the science advisory table for Ontario. So right away at the start of it, they, they talked about the wastewater signal. So this is across Ontario. You can see this is the exact same that we were monitoring for in Durham. Our numbers are included in here in the larger picture. This is the Omicron peak. So right around January 5th, uh, wastewater indicated that we peaked. The cases are still skyrocketing in Ontario because like we said, they lag the information that's found in wastewater. By the time you get to a hospital, you get checked, you get a test, and then you're an official number, COVID's passed you. So this is an early warning system. So it was interesting to see that now the science table gave all their information based on uh, wastewater surveillance, okay? Uh, this was what I was talking about, why we, they had to do it. This is provincial testing. Uh, you see, we can, at our max, we can only do 70 to 80,000 per day. Um, sorry, this is just other numbers. Uh, this is how bad it is in Ontario right now. These are hospitalizations and these are daily counts. So right now uh, we have about 200 new people entering the hospital every single you know, day. I'm not sure if... Um... I'm not seeing that. I, I'm stuck on, I'm on number nine and it's not on full screen. I don't know about other people. Oh. Anybody else have the same? Yes, I actually addressed the message saying that. Oh, okay. So it's stuck on a screen. Okay. Um, you might just want to stop sharing and then go in again yeah. and try. There, I'm going to. Uh, yeah, stop sharing. Okay, uh, can folks see me now at least and yep, hear me? See your pretty face. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm going to get away from the slides because they were almost done anyways. But so that was the principle behind it. Uh, it was a good. Uh, it it really is a good way of monitoring potential infectious diseases in your communities is through wastewater surveillance. And that's, that's the process there. So basically it involves uh, your operators or, or your sampling staff at your wastewater facilities, grabbing samples. We do it three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And we take those samples to an accredited lab. They produce the data. We give that data uh, into a data logger and then you look at it. Actually, that really is what I wanted to show you as well. We'll see if I can get that up. Okay, I'm just going to check. You should be able to see Google, right? Yep. Okay, perfect. Okay, so this is the end product for the public in Durham region. Uh, this is. Calendar. Okay. There. Now you should see the COVID data track. Yep. Okay. Uh, so what this is, is, each health unit in Ontario and probably across Canada, they have a, a COVID track. Uh, this is a summary for the public of exactly what's going on related to COVID. So if you look in Durham, is this updated? This is updated as of a few minutes ago. So uh, this is the really sad part. Uh, this is the last week in Durham. And as you can see for Eight, 11 people, unfortunately, have passed away in one week. And uh, that's out of 750,000 people. Uh, and that's on in Ontario, there's uh, thousands of people have passed away, unfortunately, and there's 70 to 80 people passing away a day. In Durham region, we've had 10 in the last week, which is really disheartening. It's people I know, it's people I work with, and it's just general people. Um, so what you see here, is the tab for wastewater. So now uh, we do, we show school outbreaks, we show everything. The, the more information we can give the public, the better educated they are, 
the better they know about how serious it is in their area. And they can make decisions that are very private, like should I get a vaccine or not? Um, how should I run my business? Things like that. So when you go to wastewater, and I'll just check that you now see a map. Correct? Anyone? Yes, can see the map. Okay, so this is the locations within Durham region that we are sampling. These are pump stations. So that one covers the town, or sorry, it's a municipality of Pickering, Ajax, Whitby, Oshawa, and then the smaller plants. So what's the results mean? Well, right now the signal strength is medium everywhere, and that's a good sign. Not so good if good for tracking data, not so good for COVID. So that means there, there's a strong signal of COVID in all of our wastewater. Okay. And then this is the trending. This is what we're really interested in. So right now across most of our region, it's stable. And that's exactly what the science table had said. We're in an area of plateau. Unfortunately, we expect to go back up again because we've recently lifted a lot of restrictions. Uh, up until two days ago, all restaurants were closed in Ontario and they have been for months and months and months to indoor dining. They could serve takeout. So they predict it's going to go up again. So Whitby, their COVID kind of footprint shows that they're, they're decreasing. So things are getting better in Whitby. Unfortunately, in Ajax, which we know backed up by sampling and unfortunately by deaths, is increasing currently. So this is just the data plotted. But I'm going to stop sharing because that is basically it. And uh, sorry, it was a little short of a presentation and details and that, but it was a little last minute. Um, but if there's any questions about how we use the data, how we track, uh, what usefulness it is, and it, it really isn't limited to COVID. Uh, there's a real future and there has been a, few, uh, a present sampling program all around the world. Lots, lots of utilities do this. Um, it's very big. Uh, for things like Olympics, uh, G8, G20 summits. Uh, we'll install online analyzers in the, uh, the water system. Uh, instead of the wastewater, we do it in the wastewater as well. Uh, originally, it was more of a terrorism thing. Uh, it was developed very strongly by countries like Israel. Things that have a places that have a real background knowledge in terrorism and the scarcity of water. Um, and they used it for just changes, general changes in water that could indicate something has changed in the water quality so severely and quickly that you need to investigate. That's one method of using this type of wastewater surveillance. Another method is infectious disease. And then uh, I'm not sure about the rest of the world, and I apologize for my lack of knowledge of it, but in Canada, we have a huge opiate crisis right now. Uh, for the last six years, uh, there's been almost 25,000 deaths. Uh, that's almost 20 people overdose a day on opiates here. And it's mainly because of drug dealers and others are lacing it with fentanyl, which is extremely small doses can cause death. So they're starting to use that now to look at communities where they need resources. You know, the people might not be showing up in the hospitals there, they, things like that. But now they're using it to look at the wastewater for evidence of pharmaceuticals and particularly opioids to say, OK, this area really has a high concentration of people using illegal drugs or legal in some centers. Um, and we need to target that area for health, for health issues, for, you know, uh, needle programs, things like that. So it's really shining a good light on wastewater as really being a source of data for a society's problems and, and health related things. And it, it really beefs up. I, I'm a big advocate of interdependencies and the fact that water and wastewater are by far one of the most important critical infrastructure sectors there is. Anyone else out there can have plans, can have, you know, electricity is important and everything, hospitals are important. None of them survive without water and wastewater services. You can't have employees if they can't go to the bathroom and drink water. So it's, it's such an important sector. And now the other sectors are realizing that and they're looking to us for data. They're looking to water and wastewater for guidance and how we can help you know, 
in our planning, our emergency planning with, if something goes wrong with water and wastewater, how do we impact their sectors? And how do their sectors, such as the chemical sector, impact us? So I'm really excited about this work and the area can take us down. I'm not excited at all about COVID. I quite dislike it. I've been impacted quite greatly myself um, and my family. So I'm all for using wastewater tools to help establish rules and regulations that help get this under control and get us all back to normal. Um, and it, it's also a good topic because with COVID, COVID being a pandemic, in Canada, we learn a lot from Europe and the state sometimes, depending on who's ahead in the case counts, things like that. So areas in the Caribbean that may not have had it that bad, when Omicron gets there, it may see an increase. And you can look back on the lessons that we've gone through, similar to what we've done with Europe, and maybe pick up some ideas how you can keep ahead of it. Um, I was a part of a, a, a panel uh, yesterday, actually, for CWWA, the Canadian uh, version of Canadian Water and Wastewater Association. And we had a representative from PEI, which is a province in Canada. It's an island. It's our only true island province where the entire province is on an island. There's a bridge or a ferry to get there. And for the entire first year and a half of the pandemic, they were virtually untouched. I mean, they knew that in Canada there was COVID, but they they had cut off their province uh, via that bridge and only allowing residents in. Um, once Omicron hit, they're like the rest of us and they're asking for help now. So it's a very good analogy to some of the Caribbean nations where it's island nations and the fact that you may already have been, hopefully not, that impacted by COVID, but there's tools out there and there's resources and people that can, can give you some assistance or just uh, advice because, um, Although, you know, different climates, different socioeconomical, when it comes down to wastewater and COVID, we really are all the same. We're, we're susceptible to COVID. It's a, it, a lot of the times it's out of our hands. It's our health practitioners and regulators that kind of set the path for how difficult or easy our lives will be with COVID. And uh, we want to be part of the solution, the wastewater community. So I will stop there. And if anybody else has some questions or anything for me on any topic related to COVID, I'm very kind of fluid in and I wouldn't mind talking about or if you've had enough then that's it I will keep okay, my mouth I shut have, and you can email I have, me. I have one question sure and um, are you are you guys responsible for for putting out the the information out there the information that you receive from the wastewater or do you have to pass on the information to the health officials and they do that uh it's a combination um, we are part of that coalition. So that was that first map of Canada where you saw, you know, 30 or 40 wastewater plants. We provide, the university lab provides the data to them so they can get a picture of Canada. And then we have an Ontario group. And then in Durham region, we're responsible for ourselves. So that tracker that you saw with all that information on it, that's our IT department. So we provide them it and they update it daily. So we provide them the wastewater information. Uh, our health unit provides them the case counts. And then there was hospital numbers that our local hospitals provide. So it's not very onerous on our end because we have partnered. Uh, and I should mention uh, the partner for Durham region is the, uh, the University Institute of Ontario, uh, UIT or Ontario Tech. It is a college and university located within Durham region. Uh, McMaster University is another great partner, as well as uh, the University of Western London, Ontario. So they do a lot of the work really on our end. It is just getting those samples consistently Mondays, Wednesdays, Fridays, transporting them to the lab and then helping them interpret in the background, like the initial setup of, uh, you know, if we sampled this pumping station, we had to calculate how many individuals does that serve. So if we get a certain strength of signal, we can compare it to the number of people. If we have two equal signals, one area is 100,000 people, one has 50, well, we're a little more worried about the 100,000 people having such a high number and not as much as the 50. So there isn't a lot of work once set up and uh, the people doing the algorithms in the background, they're very good at it. So thanks for the question. Ian, um, as you know, having worked in the Caribbean, Data is always problematic, getting data from the uh, industry. And Russell yeah. has tried very hard to get data at different times. 
How difficult is it to set up a program such as you have and how expensive is it? Is it something that's viable for Caribbean utilities? It is very viable if you have a lab that can simply test for those two parameters. Um, you, you don't have to, testing for variance of concern is quite, is quite difficult. Um, we don't do it. We have a very large lab in Durham. Uh, we don't do the genetic sequencing part to tell you whether it's Omicron versus Delta. That's done for us, but you don't really need that. That's a bonus. Um, if you have a lab that can do it, it's quite easy to set up. It's, uh, it's very easy. It's just, it's just simply a formula based on the population that goes through that water pollution control plant or pump station, and then your lab readings. And then it's no different than working with say uh, suspended solids numbers or BOD. You look at it, you look at the flow, you know your milligrams per liter going out, so. Yeah, that's <clears throat> quite an interesting <clears throat> coincidence um, um, with your presentation here. I'm just lost Wednesday to pre be precise, uh, a journalist friend of mine presented me with um, uh, an article in the voice, which was reprinted in the voice of Saint Lucia, uh, which goes like, <clears throat> excuse me, I've um, put it up in the in the chat room. Um, I, co I, I I copied and I took a photo and posted it in the chat room, but it says. Wastewater testing provides a relatively economic method whereby countries in Latin America and the Caribbean can improve their detection, diagnosis, contr control, and monitoring systems for viruses that cause diseases like COVID-19 and its variants. This tool, which complements clinical studies, allows public policymakers to have a comprehensive sustainable early warning and equitable tool to improve public health responses according to a new World Bank report. So there we go. That's just exactly what you were doing in Durham. Um, yeah, I should have uh, I should have used those words in my presentation. <laughs> uh, one, one thing, yeah, that uh, when you asked about the economics, I didn't think of that because it, it's not my project budget wise. Yeah. But it would be very economical because if you look, we had seven locations we're sampling. So we take two samples on Mondays from all those locations. So we're running 14 tests. So it costs us, and, and right now it's a partnership, so we're not paying for it. It's for the good of Ontario. But you would only pay for 14 tests if you use the old method, which is PCR tests or going to a hospital and getting tested. We can cover off 500,000 people with seven tests and get a snapshot of how it looks. Otherwise, we would have to test 20,000 people to get, okay, this many have it, this many don't. So yeah, it would be really economical and simple. Once established and you've got good sampling points, um, moving forward, like we predict in Durham that we'll keep this wastewater surveillance going. And after kind of, Omicron has run its course or the next variant, we're going to keep it going as an opportunity for flu season. Um, what happened in Canada, and it, perhaps it's the same there, I'm, I'm not that familiar, but when I was there, I, dirt, I certainly didn't get cold. So, but in Canada, every year we have flu season and it kills, I think it's 13,000 people a year, probably in Canada. Um, it's usually underlying conditions. In 2020, uh, we tracked that in Durham too. We went down to only three cases in all of 2020. 2021 was four. So what's happened is the people that were dying of cold and flu and pneumonia, they aren't because we're constantly in, we're out there wearing masks in public and the precautions for COVID are identical for us as the flu, but no one, no one five years ago, if you told me, okay, during flu season, you have to wear a mask it wouldn't fly. People just wouldn't do it in Canada. We, we don't have that mentality. We may now. So when we're done with Omicron and COVID, we're likely going to start tracking the flu because now the flu has been beaten down to nothing in Canada. Unfortunately, they say next winter, it'll come back twice as hard, but 
it's, it's another parameter we can look for. Or like I said, the, the opioid crisis is very real in Canada and it, it's very unfortunate and we're working on ways around it. But wastewater is gonna play a big part in knowing exactly, like some small communities have huge issues. You wouldn't think that they'd have such a drug issue and people overdosing so often there, but the wastewater will point that out. So it, it, it's gonna be a valuable tool. Yes, the floor is open, um, colleagues. Um, if you, you have any questions, please. Yes, I, I have another question. Yep. Um, we, with your data you're collecting, have you by any chance had, for instance, your for your wastewater um, results, where you would have a high number of cases from a certain area, but then the confirmed result, the COVID cases in that area is much less than what you're finding? Yeah, um, it it took us, a, remember the first table at the start where it kind of almost mirrored it and that I said that shouldn't be happening. We, we want it to be ahead in forecasting. We, we did change a sampling location um, and sampling times. It seemed to help, but yeah, it, it's not an exact science. It, it does give you good results. And generally when there's cases, there for sure is COVID in your wastewater. When it gets so small, that data gets a little unreliable because the kind of the base level is hard to pick up. So, so it is not exact, but it is a great start. And I know through this exercise, the, the pandemic all around the world, there, there's professionals fine tuning the, the methodology behind this and it's gonna be good. Thanks for the question, Ezekiel. Yeah. Uh, I have a question. Yes, go ahead, Mr. Wally. Wally. Hi. Hi. Afternoon, everyone. Um, I know, the, and the the methodology. It sounds it's 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 a good base. How how we're working along with the health authorities to you sell the information? Because I know in Trinidad, um, you know you have every day you have you know the cases, a yeah. thousand or or the, you have a thousand deaths. Uh, how how do they and for using the term loosely, sell, um, sell the information so that yeah. you know somebody says, well, you know what they, I think I better go, you know, uh, take it back, you know, you know what, uh, let's cancel this event because cases, you know, what's the correlation between, um, you know, the, the, the metrics that you you use and the plans that uh, pass your data versus, um, you know, the, you you do a PCR test. Over here in Trinidad, you know, you do a PCR test to your antigen and it confirms that you have COVID. How, how it sells, quote unquote, and how does it, how is it effective uh, currently? Okay, um, that's a good question, uh, Derwin. And uh, the selling part was, that's what I'm so happy about. It was easy because the health system failed in Ontario and in Canada for testing. We, we simply got overwhelmed by Omicron. In Ontario, they've predicted that from Omicron, which for us is the last six weeks, that anywhere from two to four million people out of 13 million population caught it. So they simply couldn't test that many people. So they went looking for us. So they, they embraced our data. You know, they looked at it. They've been looking at it for months and they know that it's good data. So that's that's all they had basically. They couldn't rely on tests anymore because we're flooded. So anytime you'll see case counts for Ontario or Canada, it's always got an asterisk now saying numbers are much higher. Uh, it's usually about 10 times higher. And we were having days in Canada of 20,000. So that's 200,000 people a day. I know the folks from the States online might be saying small numbers, but when you look at our population base, those are huge numbers. When you have uh, up to 4 million people getting sick in a six week span, uh, it basically brought our uh, businesses to a standstill. Uh, most places were working with 30 to 40% of their staff absent. Uh, I was tracking our staff, our frontline operations staff. And last Monday, uh, we had 142 staff off impacted, either through COVID or having to isolate because of a household member or just off sick. But those are large numbers. 
And how, when you how lose that many percentage or what number of people do you have in? I mean, 146 um, out of 10,000 is yep. many, but 146 out of 500 is. Yeah, uh, you almost hit it there. Um, basically, in works, we have 750 employees, and probably four to 500 of those are what I call frontline operational style staff. So 142 out of 500 were off that day. Wow. So, and we survived. It, it's, you know, I, I put that message out to the folks. I said, hey, it's, it's a real number that's off, but you should be proud of yourselves in the fact that there was no blip in the service to the public. I mean, we, we called in people on overtime. We might've worked a little longer. We might've pushed off some maintenance for a couple of days, but <laughs> everyone that turned on their taps got the same quality water. Everyone that flushed their toilet was happy. So yeah, it's, uh, it was high numbers. And I drift a tiny bit from the, the selling point. So uh, they wanted our data. So what they did, which was great for us, is during their uh, biweekly modeling update. So what they'll do is they'll look at all the data they've available and they forecast which direction we're going. And if things are going to get worse, they'll keep restrictions in place. And if things are going to get better, they will slowly ease off restrictions. So what they've done is they started to ease restrictions. Now they've looked at the wastewater data and said, you know what, things are going to go back up. It, it's mm -hmm. there. It, they're not leveling. They're not descending everywhere. Just like I showed you with that table of seven where they plateaued. One was increasing, one was decreasing. Think, things aren't over for Ontario by any means. So now they're predicting we're going to come back up and we're going to peak again worse than now in March and April, which is very kind of. I'm getting tired of it, but yeah, so it's a, it was an easy sell. Uh, they wanted the data, they supported the data and they analyze it. And then they're the ones that take that message out to the public through their, their national broadcasts, the news, TV, media, and through the public health units. Uh, health is broken down into 38 units across Ontario and each unit runs their own program. Then they look at their wastewater and Durham health looked at ours and they they can also there's one doctor for all of ontario chief medical officer and in each health unit there's one you're allowed to add restrictions on top of the top doctor and some areas will do that based on the wastewater results so it's good Derwin, one of the things i'll say there as to how to sell it because i i'm, I'm in touch with patricia Aquine on a weekly basis so i know how bad things are in trinidad um, but to selling it, sometimes a profit isn't recognized in their own country. And if Operators Without Borders can help in any way by bringing somebody like Ian and uh, health officials from here who can talk to this to your utility or to your ministerial people, your health officials, we'd be happy to arrange that so that we can come in and make this type of presentation to them as to how it might be helpful. Sounds good. Um, I'll, I'll try to get onto the authority. All right, now they are in a retreat. So, but it sounds good, and I'm I'm hoping that you know this kind of information, although we take long to implement it, it's just really solid. You know, instead of and, and it could be economical also. Um, you know, it could be a let off of the health system. You know, resources and that kind of thing. And then I read a report where they're saying that um, the material that holds the, the vaccine that's up the weight it's piling up and it's even causing a greater problem um so yeah so it, it sounds really really good yeah and uh, what i'll do is, is certainly anyone reach out to me uh, uh ignatius or val will give you my uh um email address and you can ask me any questions but what i'm going to do is i will because i'm not that strong in that area is look at the costing and just to kind of ask some rough numbers of what it took to put it together. Is there an ongoing cost, things like that? And I will shoot those down to you guys. And then uh, you can look and see what, you know, what the worth is. What do you get out of it for your dollar? Stacy, I was wondering if you have any comment because you're probably doing similar things in your utility. Um, there has been a lot of work um, here, you know, setting up the network and, and collecting the data. I personally have not been directly involved in it, um, but I do echo Ian's thoughts that, you know, everybody had to form these testing networks and getting the sample locations and getting all the pieces and parts put together. And there's definitely 
uh, a lot of additional um, ways that we can use this network once it's set up. So there does seem to be a, a strong feeling that all of this work is gonna pay off for a long time with lots of different things being tested long-term um, to help local areas get their arms around, you know, health and, and other types of, of um, you know, chemicals, you know, the drug <laughs> use um, of those types of problems down the road. So I think it's worth the effort to get it set up because it's going to come in handy again and again. On Ignatius, one of the things that I see here, we know how much wastewater isn't a top of mind with many governments. This might be a real opportunity for our industry to move wastewater more into the limelight. Um, they need help with COVID and uh, we're short on data. So I'm, I'm just thinking it might be a real opportunity. Well, <clears throat> yes, it is. Um, I guess here yeah, in, in many of the, uh, well, <clears throat> in many of the countries, as we also know, <laughs> um, there are, I mean, the sewage um, connections are about maybe up to maximum about 30% in some countries, let's say in a country like Trinidad and, and Jamaica, in the municipalities, you would have that wider coverage. Um, so I guess for those cities, those larger cities, and even the smaller capitals where you have the sewage networks, it could be uh, a good useful tool that can be um, considered and maybe the information shared with the environmental health authority and the health authorities. So um, perhaps that could be a good initiative uh, we can examine it, it perhaps um, at another forum where through the RSAP, I, I probably can raise that issue and see um, with some of those we other partners who, whom we collaborate can um, maybe look at this and see if they can support the countries in, in so doing. Right. Yeah, we, we found our partnerships with the university and colleges work very well. Um, they're, they're kind of crying out for wastewater sometimes. They, they want our wastewater because they've got projects going on that you know were prior to COVID for looking for things like this. So now that we're sampling three days a week and providing them, uh, you know, they're large samples. So they can do their COVID work and then also do some other work. They can be looking for other infectious diseases or drugs or, or whatever in the system. Or even parameters from water. Um, if you're having an issue with your drinking water, obviously that eventually ends up being your wastewater. It, it's also a way of tracking that too. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, in the same article that I have put up in the chat, <clears throat> excuse me, it goes on to say, as you have indicated earlier, that its use facilitates timely and more comprehensive wastewater um, public health responses to diseases like hepatitis A, influenza, yeah. other community health risks, such as antimicrobial resistance, chemical drug abuse, or overuse of pesticides. And, and in our region, that could be something that you could also um, yeah. help. It's another tool that can help in identifying and picking up some issues in, in the systems. Yeah, it's uh, because sewage plants collect such a large area, it, it's, it's a great opportunity to, to capture data on a community or even just the portion of that community that's hooked up. And then it, it gives you a direction to go. I mean, if, you have, if you're looking for a certain parameter and you find it high in that area, then you can really focus and, and you can go to someone and get the funding to say, okay, now we really need to sample, not just at the plant, we wanna sample at the end of every major intersection of the manhole. So take a sample there and we kind of know within the community, um, we found that with COVID um, at the start, uh, they were a little shy on tracking any additional data besides were you sick? Eventually they learned that, okay, for us to target populations that either are vaccine hesitant or are getting sick more often, they really had to get in the economics of things like, you know, uh, income, where you work, um, what type of housing you have. And, and it really did point out some issues of where to focus our efforts. I, I'm part of the, the COVID task force too for vaccination in Durham. Um, I mean, I have a minor part of, 
I set up, we have vaccination clinics, mass clinics. I do all the outside work only because I work with works guys so I can get barricades there, pylons, build signs quickly, things like that. So we do a lot of work on that. And, uh, and it, it's, it's good tools for that, the data too, because that's where, you know, Durham region's a large place and we'll move the clinics around to the areas that really need them. And we have, it's health that's pushing us, the health regulator, because they're saying, okay, we want you to host a clinic. We want you to host them in your five lowest postal codes for vaccine uptake or something like that. So it's interesting. There's, there's so much data going around. And this, uh, like was mentioned by Stacy, these wastewater alliances get you prepared for sharing that data. And also it's, you're prepared for when someone comes to your group and says, you know what, I really want to look at hepatitis B in, in the Caribbean. So if there's a coalition of wastewater data, then it's already set up. And, you know, that part you're used to, used to sampling, giving it to a lab, you know, working with universities. So it's, it really is a foundation for future work is what it's being established through the pandemic here. And, Number one is to get some data on COVID. So. One of the things I don't know that it was said in the in your introduction, um, Ian is one of our lead people for Operators Without Borders on the uh, operational assessments and training in, in the lab. He was in uh, or was instrumental in putting the lab training together for Dominica, and that was over about a ten week period where he went in and trained lab people. Um, so I don't know that that was brought out in the introduction in, can't remember. Uh, no, that's, thanks Val. Yeah. No, and that, we, that didn't come off and, and that we are pleased to know that as well, that you have been around the Caribbean assisting us. He, he, Ian was, um, he did the operational yeah. assessments in Belize. He was in Barbados doing the operational assessments there, um, helping them take a look at their whole operations, but um, then was, as I say, did 10 weeks of training for Dominica in their new lab. So it, a lot of experience in the Caribbean and uh, is getting to know us quite well. Yeah, I, I'm particularly fond of not only the Caribbean and, and the wastewater culture there, but the, the people as well. I, I had a great time and I like it. And similar to COVID where it, wastewater is, it, it's universal. It, there's certain finesses about it, but the, the basic science behind it, it is universal. And it's interesting, every time I've been to the Caribbean uh, with operators with boards and just by myself and to learn is I, I take stuff back. Like it's, it's either you're doing it a slightly different way and it's a way we haven't considered, either we haven't been forced to do it that way or we just haven't thought of it. And, and it's neat, like even small things, like we went out with some uh, distribution crews and the one guy had made a tool for removing the manhole covers. And, you know, people try to sell these to us all the time back up in Durham. We looked at that and thought, that's great. And we asked them how to make it. And now I, I didn't Durham yet, but uh, uh, Patrick Reeves, a gentleman from, he was another operator there. He works in the distribution system out by Val on the other coast of Canada. Yeah, they started building them. So even little things like that. I really like going into other wastewater facilities and water facilities and talking with staff and talking at things like this. And as long as you pick up something that you can kind of work with, it's good for both parties. So. Yeah. That's what it's all about, um, Valerie. Operators without borders and um, building, <laughs> yeah. part, forging partnerships globally. Yeah. Hopefully, and, yeah. And we are... Uh, and, I, and thank you to Anderson and Ezekiel for volunteering to help with the disaster SOPs. And Ezekiel's also volunteered Shannon because he's not here today. But uh, <laughs> if you don't come, you get volunteered. <laughs> so if anybody else, uh, some of you weren't on the call at the beginning, but we are looking for a few volunteers from the Caribbean area to work with our SOP committee on putting together the disaster SOPs. We have had two workshops in the Caribbean so far, virtually, um, but our head of committees asked if he can get a couple of volunteers. So we do have some people. If anybody else is interested, just put your name in the chat. Thanks. And right. thanks, Ian, that was, you know, for very last minute. Wow. <laughs> that was. Yeah, that was awesome. awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And, thanks. And we'd like to thank you very much, Ian. And um, for, as Vary said, for at last minute, putting this saving the day um, <laughs> for us again. Uh, we hope we will be early enough next week to get, and we have Stacy. I will be following up with you, Stacy, 
um, I'll get your email contact since you've registered to, since you joined and you would be registered in there. So I'll follow up with you by email so that we can um, see how we can get you someone from your team to present to us the soonest. Well, I'm, I'm going to work with Stacy on that so that it doesn't overlap with the other people I'm putting together. Right. I've, got, I've got three or four other people as well, Ignatius. I'm putting okay. a, a calendar together. So you let me know who you've got and we'll work together on it. All right, sure. Well, this has been our Kawasa Wednesday webinars. Um, this is number three in the series. Last week, we it was a sort of a field type operation where we were receiving a team out of um, Martinique and France um, through what we call the Carib San wet, um, Constructed Wetlands Project. It's a collaboration with the Wasco in Dominica and Wasco in St. Lucia and the INHR of Cuba. And so the team was on a, uh, a study visit to Dominica and St. Lucia last week. So we were caught up with them and we tried to bring the some of the proceedings um, live via Zoom and YouTube. I think we did have some experience, some technical difficulties with the sound, but at some point we're going to get some form of the recordings and to present them, to circulate them to you and other information that we may have. So that's just a sample of uh, what it's all about, the booklet. I'll, I'll try to circulate that as well. And um, it's called the Caribbean Cooperation for Wastewater Treatment Inspired by Natural Heritage, Carib San. Um, and it's using the heliconia flower as the, the plant that is going to be used in the wetland. So it's a pretty interesting program. So thanks again for joining. This is number three in our webinar series for 2022. I'm Ignatius Ja. Executive Director at Kawasa. And on Wednesdays, we speak everything to do with water and wastewater. And we very much like the collaboration with partners um, across the globe. So thank you very much and have a good evening. And we'll see you again next week. Bye. Thank you, thank you very much. Thanks, Ignatius. Thanks a lot, Ian. Bye-bye. Oh, yeah. Thanks, Val. Bye.